so are there any questions from from last time we talked about this um, radial quantization that is perhaps you know a little tricky but it's you know for the most part a trick you don't really need it uh, although if you didn't use it things would be a lot harder to show but in the literature uh, there are various treatments like that that are completely unreadable um, uh, unless you spend a lot of time so radial quantization uh, allows one to make a lot of these statements uh, you know uh, without introducing too much you know mathematical uh, rigor and baggage uh, but you know in the end it's a trick that allows us to do this it's not essential for anything for anything I said um, and you know it's useful we'll see today for various reasons uh, but you know are there any questions that you might want to ask at this point now okay so remember last time we had we ended up with this uh, understanding that in radial quantization we had to figure out what uh, conjugation was doing and conjugation to the st to the operators was acting by this in by inversions right and then and I mean I mean Hermitian conjugation and then we realized that in uh, since we can conjugate operators in the algebra by the action of inversions and um, that leads to a relation between P mu and K mu dagger. So we had this we had this uh, expression that we had derived some time ago that you can do an inversion, then a translation, and then another inversion, and that's equivalent to doing a special conformal transformation, right? Then we saw that since inversions uh, are what complex uh, are, are how complex conjugation acts on operators in the conformal theory that meant that in radial quantization uh, k mu is p mu dagger or the other way around and we then motivated this sort of picture where we view these operators as sort of raising and lowering operators where p mu is a raising operator you start with some state in the theory the primary state and then you uh, act with p mu and generate a bunch of states that belong to the same conformal multiplet and you can go the other way by acting with k mu which lowers sort of the energy in some sense where energy here is the dimension of the the scaling dimension of the operator because as you remember this came new with the dilatations which was the generator which was sort of the Hamiltonian in this picture had a commutation relation where k, k mu d was plus k while p mu had the commutation relation p mu d is minus p so the relative sign meant that one can go up in the representation using p mu and one can go down in the representation using k mu so this is sort of what we discussed uh, in the end of last lecture and this allows us this picture makes very easy the discussion of unitarity bounds now you may have heard that the bootstrap puts bounds on operator dimensions now, even before the bootstrap in conformal field theories there are unit there are unitarity bounds in the dimensions of operators but these are lower bounds okay so in particular you know from I don't know your free scalar field that is saying d equal 4 the dimension of a scalar field is 1 and even in general arguments of unitarity will tell you that if you were to compute the anomalous dimension of this thing uh, and went to, to, to a CFT the anomalous dimension would have to be positive the leading contribution to the anomalous dimension in perturbation theory would have to be positive and that's because of the reason I will explain now so if you've ever done this computation you know I'm just talking about a computation where you start with a scalar field Phi and then you compute some diagram that looks like this right so this diagram will be proportional to lambda squared in lambda Phi to the fourth theory sorry to lambda squared 
in lambda phi to the fourth theory, and you might wonder, what's the coefficient in front of this lambda squared? Is it positive or negative? And the unitarity bound that we'll be discussing tells you, without even doing the calculation, that this coefficient must be positive. And it is. It's 1 over 12, if you did the calculation. OK? So what is this unitarity bound? To, you know, let me, let me say first that we will derive it sort of using this picture where we take a primary operator and we consider the state created by this operator. So this is a primary operator, which means that when I insert this operator at the origin, right, then this generates a state on the sphere, on this sphere in radial quantization of dimension uh, equal to the dimension of this operator. Okay? Now we want to define a norm, and the norm using such operators will be defined in this way, where this is equal to delta ij. So what does this mean? If you remember, the, um, if you remember the, first of all, this i, ij indices are indices that have to do with the representation that this operator belongs to under the rotations in the Lorentz group, OK? So there's some rotation matrices in the appropriate representation. Now, I wrote here delta ij, but the form of a two-point function in a CFT is not just delta ij. It had that denominator, 1 over x squared to the delta o, right? So here, to define complex conjugation, I have defined the state O like this. And then the dagger of the state O, which is this state over here, sort of gets, I sort of define it this way to be x to the 2 delta O, um, x to the 2 delta, to, to have the, uh, let me, let, let me write, let, write it like this, x to the 2 delta O, O i dagger. OK, so when I dagger the state, this state over here takes that denominator in the two-point function um, in its definition, OK? So that then, by definition, the norm in this picture is just a delta ij, OK? Any questions? Just by definition of how I define the states. OK, so what do we do with this? So now we say, I have a state, and it's conjugate, and I also have an operator. Sorry, I missed this. So we define it like that, and as a consequence of that, the norm? It's just delta ij. The norms in Hilbert space are just orthogonal, orthonormal. Why is that from that definition? I this is definition. Yeah. And this is how I take the dagger of a state. OK. I get it. And I define the, the, the bra this way by daggering the ket and, assigning, uh, and, and appending this x to the 2 delta, so that then the states in the Hilbert space are orthonormal. Uh, what is x? x is the uh, argument of the operator, is where I define the operator, OK? OK. Um, very good. So now we have the daggered state, and we have a relation for how we dagger operators. So now I can go and write down the following. I can go and demand that if I take um, this and I dagger this, this is some matrix, right? These are mu nu indices, but this matrix uh, sort of has to be a positive definite, OK? Just by the fact that I have this state in the Hilbert space and the daggered state, if I were to demand unitarity, I would have to ask for such a matrix to be positive definite, OK? So now let's see what that gives. Um, from this, I can get. When I dagger this, I, this will become the, 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 um, the bra, and then this will become k mu. This p mu will become k mu. So I'll have uh, an equation uh, like, uh, like this, where 
maybe here it's better to put the index in the other, just, it, it doesn't really matter, but. So I have this, which I want to be positive definite. And now I know that this operator doesn't commute with this, but I can make this the commutator because I consider this to be a primary operator. So the part where this has gone through and acts on this gives me zero. So I make this the commutator for free, okay? And now I can use the algebra to write down what this is. And now I'm gonna use the algebra in this radial quantization picture where, you know, remember when I wrote dilatations before, dilatations had this negative, this purely imaginary eigenvalues, so they were anti-Hermitian operators. Now we'll redefine things so that they are Hermitian, okay? So that, you know, D on O gives me just delta on O without that, I think minus I it is what we had. And I'm working in, you know, with a conformal group of Euclidean space, so there are no eta mu nu's. It's going to be some delta mu nu here, which is just a metric in Euclidean. Uh, and after you carefully account for all the i's and so on in converting to this um, representation and using the algebra, uh, the commutator of k mu p nu, you get this, okay? And now you let this operators act on the right and you will get two times uh, delta, where delta is the uh, dimension of this operator O uh, minus those spin matrices. And here there is some delta. Um, and then you get uh, this operators acted, they now go out and you have OI, OJ, okay? And this will give us this uh, delta IJ here. And we get uh, that this must be positive definite. So in order for, this is just, a, this is a matrix in this new new indices and in order for it to give us a positive definite uh, matrix here, in order for it to be positive definite, since this is the diagonal part of it, it must be that delta is larger than the largest eigenvalue of this S mu nu matrix, okay? Because otherwise you'd have um, a negative eigenvalue, which means that the matrix is not positive definite because a positive definite matrix is by definition one whose eigenvalues are all positive. Okay, so this over here implies that max eigenvalue, or rather, let me write it the other way, that this number delta is bigger than or equal to the max eigenvalue of this S mu nu matrix, okay? So this is what we call a unitarity bound. The dimensions of operators, of primary operators in a theory cannot go below a certain value. And therefore, the dimensions of the descendants also can now be below a certain value because the descendants are derivatives on those primaries and derivative, or p mu, only, only raises the dimension, okay? And this sort of motivates this idea that there should be sort of a lower bound on this delta by unitarity, which turns out to be, uh, you know, uh, the condition for a primary operator, the operator that sits at the bottom of the multiplet is annihilated by the action of k mu as we have discussed already at the origin. Okay, so what does this uh, give? Um, so this, um, maybe, maybe, maybe I can give you a flavor of how you would try to work this out in some simple case. 
say, of a scalar operator in the other picture. Suppose you had a scalar operator, and we were writing things like phi of x, phi of o, and we weren't going into all this radial quantization, all this, uh, all this stuff, but we just said, well, okay, this is going to be, let's say we normalize the operators, and it's going to be something like this, right? And we want to show that this delta phi is bounded uh, below by a certain sort of, you know, whatever it is on the right-hand side that that is. So how would you show this? You say, well, you know, this is fine, but in a CFT, I may consider descendants of this guy. In particular, I may consider the correlation function d squared phi at x, d squared phi at zero. I might just do this, right? And in order for me to do this, I can pull these derivatives out of the correlation function, use this, and then act with the derivatives to get an answer. Now, when I act with these derivatives, this delta phi will appear in the coefficient, right? As will appear, you know, the space-time dimension because we're going to get contractions of indices, right? And in the end, what you'll find is that there is a relation that this delta phi has with the space-time dimension that it has to satisfy so that the coefficient of that two-point function, this one, is not uh, negative. And this is equivalent to that thing over there. This is just more general. But you could go home yourselves and verify just by taking derivatives that the coefficient out front will have a chance to be negative unless you impose that this delta phi is larger than something. And you'll find that in this case for the scalar, delta phi has to be larger than what you know already from QFT, uh, d minus 2 over 2. Of course, I didn't, so you can find it using this, just two derivatives. But then you may wonder, well, OK, but what if I take four derivatives, or six derivatives, or 155 derivatives uh, in each of these uh, phi's? Uh, do I get a stronger constraint? OK? It's not easy to prove that you don't. And it has been argued and sort of proved in papers that you don't, but I don't understand the proof. And, you know, it is very heavily mathematical that you don't. But let's just say that you don't. <laughs> OK? But it's not an easy thing to show that the there, there is no constraint stronger than this arising by considering, you know, um, uh, more and more derivatives. And, you know, you have to show that because the multiplet of phi contains all derivatives, uh, all, however many derivatives you want acting on phi. It's an infinite Verma module with phi sitting at the bottom. And, you know, just from doing this, you find this, but you don't know that it's the strongest one, uh, strongest constraint. Of course, we know in this case that uh, we have the free scalar that saturates the bound, so the bound cannot be stronger than this, right? But to prove that it isn't, without using that example, uh, is quite, quite, um, quite non-trivial. Uh, okay, so this is what you prove for scalars. There is another, of course, very, uh, very, um, let's say, popular representation of the conform of the of the Lorentz group. This is uh, traceless symmetric tensors, right? And for traceless symmetric tensors, so for uh, rank, well, let's not call them rank L traceless symmetric. Let's just call them for spin L tensors, which is what for spin L tensors, you get that delta has to be larger than or equal to D minus L plus 2. OK, so this is uh, the unitarity bound for spin L tensors. And um, let's look at it. So in, uh, as we said, this, uh, this bound is saturated, we know, for the free scalar, right? The free scalar saturates this bound. And So the free, scalar sat the free scalar saturates this bound, and the free scalar satisfies that box phi on it is zero. 
Because when you saturate the bound, remember, you derived this by saying that the coefficient that appears here, c of delta and d times whatever, has to be positive, right? So when you saturate the bound, the coefficient is 0, right? Which means that you get the two-point function to be 0, but the only way for a two-point function in a positive norm Hilbert space to be 0 I'm going to cross the is for the operator itself to be 0. And this is the fact that this is a free scalar, OK? So it's all consistent. For spin L tensors, to saturate the bound, you need a conservation condition similarly. And the conservation condition uh, is, for example, um, if you have L equal 1, you see here it becomes d minus 1. And you know operators of dimension d minus 1 that may, you may think saturate this bound. They're conserved currents in a theory. Uh, spin 1, conserved currents, will saturate that bound. You also know another case with L equal 2 where you have an operation of dimension d that saturates the bound, and that's the stress energy tensor, which is a conserved current of translations in the theory, um, even in a conformal theory, of course. But this bound is, is valid for any L larger than or equal to 1. Okay? In a free theory, for example, you have what people call conserved currents for any L. Even beyond the stress tensor, you have conserved operators for spin 3, 4, 5. Uh, these are broken in interacting theories, while conserved currents are associated by symmetries, be it space-time symmetries like the stress tensor, or global symmetries like uh, current, spin one current, they will remain uh, if you preserve the symmetries. Okay? However, those higher spin currents that exist in a free theory, you, may, you will not be able to preserve, uh, to preserve them in an interacting theory. Okay? Okay. And notice how uh, the last comment about this is to notice how we didn't use anything about Lagrangians here. So we didn't derive that del squared phi must be zero by saying, OK, here is the free scalar Lagrangian, you know, vary with respect to the field and get the other Lagrange equation and so on. We didn't impose this. We said, if this thing is to be zero in a positive normal Hilbert space, the operator itself must be zero. So that told us that in order to saturate the bound, we need a free scalar. Okay? All right, any questions about these unitarity bounds? And of course, one can find unitarity bounds for all representations of the Lorentz group. In general, if you were to write a general representation of the Lorentz group, uh, you weren't going to use mu nu indices because this means that it's an integer spin representation, but we have non integer spin representations. And in order to denote those more, more, more um, conveniently, you view the Lorentz group as SU2 cross SU2, right? And then you have this alpha and alpha dot indices. So you will have alpha 1 to alpha j, and then alpha 1 dot to alpha dot, say, j bar at point x. So this is some representation of the Lorentz group, right? Depending on how you choose things, you may call this the j over 2, j bar over 2 representation of the Lorentz group. And the uh, dimensions will be then, instead of using L here, you'll use this j and j bar in the space-time dimension, but you'll get similar, uh, similar bounds, OK? Any questions about this? Go do it, though. I mean, if you haven't done it, go do this. It's quite instructive. Um, it will, uh, you know, help you see sort of like how the structure arises. Although it's basic algebra. Okay. So the next thing we want to talk about in, so we talked a lot about basically two-point functions so far, right? We said two-point functions are fixed. We, we use them in sort of some regular quantization like this. We also went to radial quantization, proved general properties. So now what we want to do is um, go beyond the two-point function. And we already discussed that the three-point function is fixed by conformal symmetry um, in, in some sense, in, 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 in the sense that 
the x dependence of the three-point function is fixed, the functional dependence. Of course, the parameters that appear there, the deltas and the coefficients are not fixed. They are dynamical numbers, but the x dependence is fixed. So now it turns out that there is a very, um, a very useful tool when we discuss conformal field theories. That's called the operator product expansion. And you know this from quantum field theory is that if you take the product of two operators, and this is not a local thing, it depends on two points, x and y, so you take this bilocal thing, right? Then you say that this bilocal thing can be represented in any correlation function as an infinite sum over local operators where the bilocality is absorbed into some C function coefficients, the Wilson coefficients, right? So the operators act at one point but you take an infinite linear combination of them, which depends on both points. Uh, and that is equivalent in any correlation function to the left-hand side, where you act with the two operators at separated points. OK, so this is the operator product expansion. And in, 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 a, in a CFT, you can get, you can get um, a lot out of the fact that we have this radial quantization picture. So we had that sphere. And we said that the way we um, generate states on, on the sphere is by inserting operators inside the sphere, right? So let's insert two operators. Let's say phi 1 at x. And maybe we'll put phi 2 at the origin. So we don't insert just one operator. We insert two operators, OK? And then we're going to say, OK, fine, this generates some state uh, psi in the Hilbert space, oh, sorry, in the Hilbert space defined on the sphere. Um, and we also know that this psi will have some expansion in terms of these uh, complete basis of states that are defined uh, as eigenstates of the dilatation operator. Okay? So this Cn is now a function of x, okay, of that point x of uh, the phi one insertion, okay. So, so, so when you say insert the operators, you mean acting inside? Equip yes. So if I weren't, if I didn't insert anything, that would have the identity operator. That would give me the vacuum and it's the order in the boundary in in the um, in the sphere. Yeah. Here I am inserting operators, and as we show the, other, the last time, this generates states. And if you. The order? At this point, it doesn't matter. I'm, not, I'm just considering these operators instead. I'm not computing correlation functions to worry about the order. It doesn't matter what order you put them in. I'm just inserting operators, and I'm saying, whatever order I put them in, I'm going to generate some state. And whatever state that is, it will have an expansion in uh, eigenstates of the dilatation operator, okay? where the x dependence will go into this coefficient cn, whatever state that is. OK. Um, OK, good. So so this is just an equation in the Hilbert space. But we know that these operators over here, these delta n operators over here, will be either primaries or descendants. Uh, states and I, uh, the states delta n will also be able to arise from insertions of either primaries in the uh, sphere, inside the sphere, or descendants inside. There's no other option, right? Because in a CFT, we either have primaries or descendants. Here, we are inserting a product of operators. So this is not a local operator we're inserting, but any local operator has to be a primary or a descendant. And since we have the states delta n here and the state operator correspondence, we know that each of these delta n's will correspond to either a primary or a descendant insertion. OK? We don't know which one it is, but we know that there's going to be either a primary or a descendant associated with these states. And, um, and therefore, if I consider the action of this on the vacuum, the action of these operators on the vacuum, then I will be able to write something 
only in terms of primary operators. Let me write this down. So what does this equation mean? So I motivated that these states over here will be states generated by a primary descendant, right? So acting on the vacuum will then mean that I may have primaries in this infinite in this sum. And if I have descendants, I take the corresponding primary, right? And I modify this coefficient accordingly to put the right derivatives here to generate that descendant. And I add it in. Okay? So whatever it is, I can write down an equation like this. Where this is a fancy object, it's a very complicated object. We'll see how you can compute it. But it's a fancy object that is not just some coefficient that contains it's a function of x. It also has this dependence on the derivative on this point because it needs to be able to generate descendants as well as primaries. And descendants are derivatives of primaries. Okay? Is that clear? Okay, very good. Okay. So the, the local operators on the right hand side, could it be you chose y equals null? So, but could it be any? So but what I mean by O here are these O's. Okay, let me write like this. And these are primaries now. But I mean, the point, the point I defined at, at the origin, I mean, could you have chosen any point? Yes, yes, I could, I could define this at any midpoint or anything. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, here, I decided to go to the origin for this point. But since I have these derivatives here, I have first have to consider the general point, take the derivatives, and then go to the origin. But I could go anywhere I wanted here. Okay. Yeah. There will be there would be an equivalent uh, relation, but then this x would not be just x, would be x minus wherever I went here. Okay? Yeah. Okay. So it's just a simple form of the equation. So this proves that there exists an OPE in, uh, in CFTs. Okay? Just using the state operator correspondence. Okay? What more can we... I mean, I introduced, I, I, I introduced this thing because I just didn't want to write down descendants of this. But, you know, I can always generate these descendants, that's the point, with grouping these derivatives into some complicated object. Okay? Uh, formally, I can always write this down, and we can see that it's computationally, you can also use it. We'll see now in a little bit. But what we used there was the state operator correspondence. Now we can use another fact. In quantum field theory, the OPE is not a convergent, it's an asymptotic expansion, just like everything in quantum field theory. However, in CFT, uh, the expansion is actually convergent at finite separation x. And the way it is convergent is very hard to show if you're not in radial quantization. But in radial quantization, well, uh, you have to appeal to the state operator correspondence, which is easiest in radial quantization. But if you have the state operator correspondence, then you recall that any state in a Hilbert space uh, can be written as a convergent sum of other states in the Hilbert space. In particular, you might use, uh, you might use eigenstates of dilatations here. Any state in the Hilbert space will be able to be written that way, right? And that's a convergent sum. It's a sort of a, a property of... Uh, of, uh, um, of Hilbert spaces. And therefore, using now again the state operator correspondence means that since from these two operators we got some state, that state can be written as an infinite sum in that way, well, that then means that that state can be uh, approximated in a convergent way, can be expressed in a convergent way as this sum, which means that the product of those operators uh, is, uh, gives rise to an OPE, which is also a convergent uh, expansion. So basically use convergence in Hilbert space uh, convergence in Hilbert space implies convergent 
o p e okay so the only thing that perhaps is a little bit um, um, funny looking at this point is this object over here okay this c o of x comma d y so let me show you how you would try to compute this okay any questions about this so the state operator the state operator correspondence allows us to get pretty far here much farther than you would in general uh, quantum field theory so let's now try to compute this this object C, at least in some expansion, so we get an idea about what it looks like, okay? So for this, we will consider the OPE of two operators, phi 1 of x, uh, phi 2 of 0, and we will um, write this in the following way. There will be some coefficient over x to some power. This is going to be um, our sort of guess of what this looks like and then there will be some operator along with all its primaries plus uh, contributions from other primaries okay so this is the general form that this OPE is going to take and we isolate it one particular uh, contribution, one particular, pri one particular primary operator, along with whatever descendants of that primary might appear, and then all the rest is, is there. And um, let's now act with D on this OP. The generator of dilatations. We act on this OP with the generator of dilatation, dilatations and so this, remember, this D will act like minus I uh, X dot D plus delta, right? But now we'll act like this uh, on this operator. Um, so you'll get an action on this operator and then you get an action on this operator by the chain rule, right? And um, what this will look like. So you can, of course, put this operator at Y, take this derivative and then send y to zero. But since this x is just sticking out here, you will get rid of that derivative. There is not going to be an associated derivative. But for the first one, you'll get one. And that's, you get delta 1 plus x dot d plus delta 2 here. Um, and then you'll get your operators back. And now I'm going to focus on this contribution. And I'm going to put that in there. So I'm going to bring this over here, and I'm going to write this as, uh, if you do the algebra, there's going to be minus i delta 1 plus delta 2, and then you just do the x dot d on that thing over here. This is at 0, so it's only going to act here. And you get, what do you get? Minus k. Um, um, c over x to the k okay so this is what you get just by explicitly evaluating the action of dilatations as it relates to the contribution of this particular primary uh, in the OPE of phi 1 with phi 2 okay and so that's one thing um, And so here we use a differential representation of the operator. On the other hand, when we have on the other side of the OPE, we had this c over x to the k, the k times the operator O, uh, this operator O at 0. And the action of this, of dilatation on this. I'm sorry, the other They, they, they don't bring in this O. Ah, okay. so, there are so they are there. Terms. They, they're, they're all there. But here I'm focusing on the contribution associated with this particular uh, operator O. Okay? 
So what was I doing now? Right. So on the other hand, acting with this will also give you something like this. So basically, uh, you act on both sides of P, and you better get the same answer no matter which way you do it, right? And therefore, these two must be equal, which gives you that K is delta 1 plus delta 2 minus delta O. So we're starting to see that if you don't take the derivatives there, if you just consider the term in that C without the dy, so we see that for this operator O in particular, you get 1 over x to the k, or some coefficient over x to the k, where k is related to delta 1, delta 2, and delta O in that way, which is sort of what you would expect, because x here is the only thing that carries dimensions. It has dimension mass dimension minus 1, right, if you think about it that way. So the dimension of this operator plus the dimension of this operator minus the dimension has, has to equal to the dimension of this operator plus whatever dimension this brings in. And that's that equation over there. OK? It could vanish, but here by assumption, I'm assuming that there is a contribution to this OP from this operator with the C non-zero. It doesn't tell you right now, but if you assume that C is non-zero, then you derive that if that operator can appear, then the power k here, which is sort of the leading term in that CO that I wrote down, where lead, by leading I mean the dy dependence has been neglected, because I've neglected here all the descendants of this operator, just O. This power k has to be related to delta 1 plus delta 2 minus uh, delta O in that way. OK, so that's, um, that's the leading contribution. How do you determine, then, the coefficients in front of these derivatives? So let's determine one of them, or let's see how you determine one of them. Maybe we will not do the whole algebra, but... So you go and say, OK, now I determined um, this power k. I'll consider the same thing. And then this is c over x to the k, where k I determined already. I know my operator O is here, but now let me assume that with some coefficient alpha, there is a descendant of O that appears with one derivative. I'm just going to look at the first uh, descendant of O. It's going to be a derivative on O, and I better do something with this index. The only thing I can do is contract it with x mu. Okay? So this is going to be the general form of this. The only thing I can do is contract it with x mu to preserve, of course, here Lorentz invariance. So, I want to now determine alpha. Of course, remember here, there are also these other contributions of other descendants. But here, I'm focusing on a particular descendant, uh, on a particular operator, O, and the descendants that it might bring in. So how do you determine this alpha? Here, we didn't need to uh, change the order of derivatives, so we acted with D. But if you need to change the order of derivatives of operators you're looking at, what might you think you need to act with? to start getting relations. You could act with P, but you won't get much with P because it's a simple derivative. It won't allow you to relate terms with different numbers of derivatives. While this k mu had a much more complicated relation. It had this x squared d mu, and then it had even a piece with not, without d mu's, right? With just delta. So that will allow you to get a relation. So let's see how this works. Uh, Again, you do the same thing. You act with k mu on the product. It's basically, basically exactly what we did here, these two equations, but for k mu. And uh, what you get is, of course, k mu can only act on phi 1 now, because phi 2 is assumed to be a primary, and it's at 0, so that action will be zero. So I only need to worry about KMU acting on this guy. Okay? And KMU acting on this guy will give me I x squared d mu minus two x mu x dot d uh, minus 
to delta 1 x mu plus other things. And now, if I act on the right-hand side, How do I act with this? Well, uh, well, K mu sees the derivative here, and that's not good, right? So it will see the derivative here, and that's not good. So you will have to make this into a P mu, then use the commutation relation of K with P to pass it through. And then when K passes through and hits this, you get your zero again, because this is a primary, right? So it's a little bit of algebra. And uh, you can go check my math, but... What I find in the end here is that this is minus 2c over x to the k alpha x mu i Okay, so this is what you get here. This is the only uh, contribution that survives. And now what do I have? I have that this must be equal to this, okay? Here I'm not done because I haven't taken the derivatives. This the new derivatives act on this x, so they're gonna generate a bunch of terms, right? You can go do the algebra and find that the demanding equality of these two things uh, gives you, determines alpha to be equal to <coughs> delta one minus delta two plus delta O divided by 2 delta O. Okay? It's just a matter of doing the, um, the algebra. But here we are assuming that, phi, that these phi's are primaries, right? These phi's are primaries and O is a primary. Yes. So that when I put it in at zero, and k sees it, it kills it. But what about before? Are we assume that phi were primaries even before? Yes, yes. Phi's were primaries from the beginning, and I took their OPE. So this phi's are primaries doesn't mean that the product is a primary. Uh -huh, the pro product, uh, because the product is not at zero. This is at x. So this is not a primary. Well, even if phi 1 is a primary, phi 1 of x is not annihilated by k mu, right? So this product will have an expansion using the OPE in this way, where what can appear on the right-hand side is primary sort descendants, mm -hmm. OK? But what if they were descendants? The, the expansion would still look the same, right? The if these were descendants. Yeah. If these were descendants, they would be written as derivatives of primaries. Uh -huh. So you'd use this again, and then act with whatever derivatives you had to act okay. to generate that. Uh, that expansion of the descendant. So the logic here is to take this thing to which both primaries and descendants contribute from the other side of the OPE and then say, okay, what can these contributions look like? In general, I will think of them in sort of an expanded way like we do here, right? And say, okay, well, this is the primary. The only thing to determine is this K. We use dilatations, we determined K if you know delta 1, delta 2, and delta O. But then we put an arbitrary coefficient alpha here for the contribution of the first descendant of that primary. And then we used the action of k mu to determine that alpha is again related to the dimensions of these uh, operators that participate in this, um, in this game. And of course, you can continue this game. You could have something like plus b, some, other, some, some beta, some other coefficient, x squared d squared on O, and you can go and determine this B. You just have to do a lot more algebra, this beta. You'll just have to do a lot more algebra because you're going to have to now, once you know this, act with k mu to lower the derivative of this and compare it with the action you get from this one. And they will both start contributing, and you know, you'll know you have to determine things sort of order by order. This is one way to do it. There is a faster way to do it. Well, I don't know faster, but more say, um, 
Um, clear way to see that you can determine it, let's say, by um, using the fact that the three-point function of this phi 1 and phi 2, so suppose you put phi 1 at x, phi 2 at 0, and then you take some other operator, some operator O, it could be that O over there, at point Z, you have this three-point function, okay? And then you want to say that um, you want to say that this three-point function uh, I can go and use the OPE in these two operators over here. Now if I use the OPE in these two operators over here, I'm going to have an infinite sum over O primes that appear in this OPE, not just O, all the O primes, any primary operator. And that sum will have to be written, there will be this CO primes, this other CO prime, which is a function of x. And um, so here it's going to be dy. And then I'm going to be left with the two-point function of O at, uh, at, sorry, O prime at y, O at z. Right? This is going to be the structure. And then I'm going to have to take y to 0. To get this, I just put the OP in since it's the correlation function. I can use the OP in any correlation function. And then I have to recall a very crucial fact. So this O, you know, can be any operator. You can have spin and this, this O prime. Any operator that I can write down in this OP. And, but it could only be a primary, right? Because this over here accounts for the descendants as we have explained. So this O's O primes are primaries. This O is also a primary. So now what do I use? Well, I use the fact that in a CFT, an operator can only have a two-point function with itself. So this sum goes away. An infinite sum, but there's only one contribution to it. OK? <coughs> and this contribution tells me that this becomes CO, and then this other CO. of basically O at Y, O at Z. OK? So now I know the three-point function in a CFT. I know the general form of the three-point function in a CFT. It's kinematically uh, constrained. I know the general form of the two-point function in a CFT. It's kinematically constrained. So what is this? Well, this is just the differential operator that you can act on the two-point function to get the three-point function. I mean, this motivates that this thing exists. Of course, you know, in complicated cases, uh, in simple cases, you can determine this operator. But in complicated cases where these operators may have spin and so on, this is clearly a, a, a highly uh, non-trivial relation to work out. But formally, it is what this operator is doing. OK. <coughs> In simple cases, yes, you, you, you can find. So what people used to do, you know, in simple cases where this is a scalar, say, as well. But suppose you start having um, complicated representations, or even, even, even spin L representations. Now you have to pick the spin L thing over here. And for the two-point function of that spin L thing, it's quite complicated. In the numerator, you have this. I'll write it down in the next. In the next uh, lecture, uh, you have these IMU new tensors, these inversion tensors, right, that appear in the in the in the numerator, and then one over this over x squared to some power, and now you have to find the differential operator that, when you act on this very complicated thing, gives you the three-point function, and you know it's clearly not going to be easy. It's not a well-defined mathematical problem. It, it it isn't some yes, it's not something that's systematic in 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 some in some in some way. Yeah. Uh, so what you resort to in those cases is sort of like make sense of it in that way. Um, but yeah, it's not, but formally, this shows that such an operator uh, that maps the two-point function essentially to the three-point function exists uh, in the conformal field theory. So does, it, does 
this suggests that all the primary operators appear in the Yoki expansion? Well, so well the fact that you can do this, so any OC. these are appropriate operators for whose coefficients are non-zero. It must happen that this operator is among them, otherwise you'll get zero. For example, suppose these operators were the same and this had an index mu. Yeah. Right? Then you know that this is zero because if you have the OPE of two operators that are the same, scalar operator, it's only even spin operators that can appear on the right hand side. Equivalently, the three-point function of an operator of two of two of, the, of these two identical scalar operators with an index uh, a spin one operator is zero. So now you don't get anything here because this is zero. You can do this, right? But among these operators, you will never find this O mu. These O primes will never include O mu. While they will include some spin two operator, spin four operator, spin six operator, but ne never this O mu. So this two-point function will be zero for all contributions, and then zero equals zero. So you have to use uh, both properties of the OPE, right? And then the form of three-point functions and two-point functions uh, to get this equation to work consistently. So it's not all operators in the theory. It's all operators consistent with requirements like Bose symmetry in this case, or if you have some global symmetry, things have to uh, belong in the right representations and so on. Uh, it's not anything that can appear. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So, of course, you know, we introduced this C and, and all this stuff and these ideas that oh, we can only worry about the primaries and we can always generate the descendants because we can always take derivatives, essentially. Now, these are not easy things to do, but formally, they show, once again, that the relevant, meaning the important operators in a conformal field theory are the primaries, okay? And we'll see now how that uh, manifests itself when we consider four-point functions. So far, everything was fixed kinematically in, as far as the x-dependence goes. x1, x2, x3, however, or x1, x2 if you have a two-point function. The only unknowns were these deltas and you know, these coefficients that we were carrying around uh, so in the three-point function. So now we want to look at something that is more non-trivial. And that let's take to be the four-point function of an, uh, of an operator phi. So the same operator at all four points. And remember, we mentioned in the first lecture that, or maybe the second, I don't remember, the first probably that when you have up to three points in space, there is no conformal invariant one can write down, and therefore those correlation functions will be completely fixed kinematically. But now, when you have four points, there are these, these um, conformal invariants. People call them typically U and V. And I will use that notation. Okay, these are the U and V conformal invariants. You can go home and do all the conformal transformations you want, and you better not change any of these two. Okay? Very good. So, what does that mean? That, well, then that says that. Sure, there's going to be some kinematic constraints on the, for, on the form of this four-point function. Kinematic, I mean uh, covariance constraints, so that it has to satisfy the algebra in, um, uh, in the obvious way. But there will be, no matter how many conformal transformations I do on the four-point function, I will not be able to fix a function of u and v since those are conformal invariants. Right? So the, the, the transformations don't act on them, they're invariants. 
So what does that mean? Well, that means that if I took this, and suppose I viewed it this way, I used the OPE twice, once in the first two operators and once in the second two, then I may write this in the following way. There's going to be a sum, well, there's going to be a double sum, because I'm going to use the OPE here, I'm going to use the OPE there, it's going to be a double sum, but then I'm going to remember that in a CFT, it's only the two-point function of an operator with itself that can be non-zero. Everything else is zero. So that double sum is basically uh, only one sum. So that's gonna, uh, I'm going to call that the sum over O. And then I'm going to have this OP coefficients. I'm going to call them lambda now, lambda phi phi O squared. I'm going to get them twice. And then there is the CO like this, and then the other CO like this, and I'm, I'm left with the two-point function, right? I use the OPE twice. This is what I get. And these O's are primaries or primaries and descendants? Very good. They're only primaries because I wrote explicitly these objects down. And these are all the spin, even spin primaries, because I'm considering the four-point function of the same operator, uh, even spin uh, primaries that can appear. And there is an infinite number of them, typically, in a CFT. Um, and this is, therefore, an infinite sum that we can use to express this four-point function. If you want to have a picture of it, you may think about it in, in this sort of way, where you have your uh, points 1, 2, 3, 4, and then you exchange this operator's O in this way, but along with O you exchange in an appropriate way all the op operators in the multiplet of O, all the descendants, which is this stuff over there. Okay, so this is a picture. Sorry? Um, the, so this constraints generally I'm not using here specifically 2D. Um, uh, what I will be discussing are the global blocks, if you want. And this typically will be infinite sums, if that's what you're getting to. Maybe I don't understand what you, what you mean by the question. OK, all right. OK, so. So these are all the even spin operators, primary operators. And I can write this in the following form. Why even spin again? Why even spin? Yes. Well, well spin if I have two operators that are identical, and I try to exchange this even sp an odd spin operator, the coefficient is zero because I can exchange the order of the operators. And x will go to minus x, so something equal to minus itself is zero. That's, ju that's um, just Bose symmetry, nothing fancy. Yeah. So I can, I can write this, express this in this way, where sum over the O's, uh, lambda phi phi O squared, G Well, what did I do here? Well, I said that, look, there's going to be some sort of kinematic constraints in this four-point function. There is no spin here, so there's not going to be any new, new indices to carry around, but these have some dimensions. And those dimensions are going to be captured by this uh, uh, prefactor over here. The rest is dimensionless, and it's going to go into an infinite sum. Maybe you can call this some function g of u and v, which I write as an infinite sum over all the primaries, an infinite weighted sum, weighted by the three-point function coefficients of some, coefficient, uh, of some functions of u and v, which also depend on the dimension and the spin of the exchanged operator O. Okay? So after I use the algebra, 
I get this prefactor over here, and I leave undetermined this thing over here, which I now expand using this OPE idea into an infinite sum over all the primaries of this, of this type. Okay? What this is, is what we call the conformal block. Okay? It's sort of the building block of the four-point function. If you know all the operators in the theory, O, their dimensions and their spins, and if you know those three-point function coefficients, remember, these are not four-point function uh, quantities. These quantities appear already in the three-point function and the two-point function. Not these, but these appear in the two-point function. These appear in the three-point function and these two. So I didn't introduce anything new other than this quantity g, this function g of u and v, which is a function of these invariants, which at this point is completely undetermined and conformal symmetry uh, cannot help me determine it because these are invariants. Okay, but this is a completely general decomposition of the four-point function that I can write down. Okay? And the, you know, what the conformal block does is basically it collects the contributions of all the descendants, it collects the action of those CO operators, these derivative operators, it collects their action into one function for every primary. Okay? So you don't need to know, if you know the conformal block, you don't need to know what these COs are. You know that their action will be resummed by their uh, specific form, uh, by the specific form, in the specific form of the conformal block. Is that clear? Now, of course, you can write this down. It's uh, highly complicated to determine what this is. Okay? Um, and this is the simplest case as well. Uh, just four identical scalars. But everything I will say also works if you have operators that are not identical and not scalars. This idea is still there. You will still have only two invariants. Doesn't matter what the spin of the operators is. It depends on how many points in space you have. So for four points, you have, four, uh, you have two invariants. That's it. And it's going to be a lot more complicated on the right-hand side. Nevertheless, the idea will be exactly the same. But there are these things called conformal blocks that you can use to decompose the four-point function and resum the contributions of all the descendants of any given primary. So that all you need to know is the spectrum of the theory to then determine the four-point function. Okay? Any questions? Yeah. Can you repeat this? How did you get this prefactor? This? Yeah. I just wanted to soak up basically the dimensions. If you act with dilatations and so on, you'll see that you'll need the dimension, this is the dimension of phi, to be carried by something on the right-hand side, right? And then that g is a function of u and v, which are just, they don't have dimensions. And so in this decomposition, right, you, b b using the OPE twice, in this decomposition, because I bring in x1 with x2 and then x3 with x4, when I use the OPE here, right, I'm going to get this. It, it's like that x to the k we had before, right? It's going to be x12 because I'm using the OPE here, and then it's going to be x34 if I use the OPE here. If I use, say, phi1 with phi4 and then phi2 with phi3, I was going to have x14 and x23 there. And we're going to see how that works later when we examine crossing next week. But uh, this, is, this, is the, um, this is how you, how you get that. Well, what appears in the two-point function, in, three point, in two-point function, you have this delta, uh, sorry, in the two-point function, um, you have this delta phi that appears. In the three-point function, you have this lambda phi phi o's that appear, the three-point function of phi and phi, phi phi o. And so we didn't introduce any new, uh, you know, numbers. We just introduced this function g that is a function of u and v. And for every delta and l that contributes, it's, it's shown, it, it has a specific form, we think. Formally, we wrote this down now, but of course we haven't computed it. But it turns out that you can compute it, which is, you know, something pretty amazing that you can do. Uh, and that's what I want to discuss now.
I mean, you can, of course, write many formal expressions for this, and I'm going to start doing that. Uh, but the question is, how do you compute it? So let me, um, let me write down something a little complicated. Um, let me write it like this, which is the two-point function of an operator of spin L. So here, here it is. It's not that bad, actually. You have where this i tensor, um, let me write it like this. is this. So if you were to work out the constraints of conformal symmetry for the two-point function of a spin L operator, you are going to get this mess, OK? This is a spin L operator. You have to use these tensors. And OK, it is what it is. Uh, not trivial to work out, but this is what it is. So then in that case, so why did I write this down? Because here. Remember, these are even spin operators that appear here. I wrote them as O's, but this was just symbolic. These are O's that look like those. They carry these indices, right? And now, if I want to write the block associated with the operator with dimension delta O as spin L O, say spin 2 or spin 4, I can write it in the following form. U and V. And Okay, so here it is. So here it is. This is a conformal block. Okay, it's completely useless. But formally, it's an expression you can write for conformal blocks if you know what that C is, which you can work out as we did before, right? We did it before for a simple case. Well, you can stick it in there and start to get an idea about what the conformal block looks like. So this is what we're going to do now. OK? But is this clear that you can write down formal expressions in terms of this object we were dealing with in the previous hour, this C, this differential operator C, which we, I sort of showed you how to compute it, right? Now you have to stick it in here and do all these things and contractions and use this I tensor. And uh, where here, what I mean by this I with the many indices is this thing over here. OK? This I is that thing over there. But from, from what you did before, it's not clear that you can compute a closed form for the differential operator C. Yeah, it's not. So it's not, but we motivated, it, but we motivated that it exists, right? We showed how you can expand it out and start computing coefficients. But you're right. We did not prove that uh, one can actually compute this. Yeah. And. Uh, so, you know, people wrote these expressions a long time ago, and what they started doing then is expanding things out and computing coefficients and seeing how things work, right? And that was the state of the art until Dolan and Osborne were able to uh, take these expressions and set up a certain recursion relation that these things have to satisfy. And then they were even able to solve that recursion relation. So it's not like someone directly determined these Cs. Uh, but, and, and what I'm going to do today is different. It's not going to be that way of determining these this conformal blocks. Uh, then people, again, Dolan and Osborne realized that, in fact, these uh, are um, 
these are um, eigenvectors of the conformal Casimir, these conformal blocks. So you can set up a differential equation that they have to satisfy, which is what we're going to do next. And you can actually solve that differential equation in some cases. So you write that getting explicit expressions for these, you can write down formal expressions and, you know, you can then expand them out and write them to any order that you want, right? Nevertheless, it's not like you first fix these and then you compute that. That's not how uh, we will compute it. Okay? Any? I is the symmetrization, the whole symmetrization. This, yeah, this quantity I over here is all this thing using this using this uh, I am union. Okay. So, so you said so the, the G's can't be determined by conformal symmetry. Sorry, which G's? The, the conformal block. These guys. By conformal symmetry alone, because you, you, you were saying U and B. Alone. They are invariants, yes. So what, what additional thing are we, we so now we're determining? We are, yes, we are, thing, well, in, in a sense, it's conformal symmetry, again. Yeah, that's, that's the OPE. We're saying we yeah, it, it, no, what I meant is that you won't be able to deter determine them simply by, um, I erased it, but before here we were acting with K mu on the product of operators and we were matching things left and right. Yeah. You won't be able to determine them kinematically that way, right? But it turns out that the conformal symmetry is enough, as you see here, because we managed to relate them to things that are in the three-point function. So it's not obvious that you can determine them. However, using the OPE, you are able to, to, to express them in terms of things that are in the three-point function and the two-point function. Okay. And these are kinematically determined in some sense. So the whole structure allows you to determine them along with the OPE, which is not just conformal symmetry. The OPE is essential to being able to reduce this for the convergence of the OPE in particular is essential to being able to reduce this four-point function into that form. And the fact that it converges allows you to write equations like this down. Otherwise, all these would make no sense, right? So I I the quick answer to your question is conformal symmetry plus OPE. Yeah. Is there any way of identifying what consistence of the differential equations would be? Can you just choose an arbitrary one that I'll Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, you set up, as you'll see, we set up a differential equation. Turns out you can solve it. but you know, there are higher Casimirs that this also are eigenfunctions of, you know, in some cases they help, but for the simple things that we'll do, uh, even the leading quadratic Casimir will be enough to determine them. But there's no a priori sort of um, minimal set of conditions that if you were able to fulfill, you'd solve them. Any other questions? Okay, so before we try to solve them, or in general, let's try to get an idea again of what they might look like. It is always, of course, instructive when you work out something new to see how it works, uh, sort of some, in, some, in some expansion or in some limit. So let's see if we can come up with a limit uh, where that expression simplifies, okay? So there is um, the following limit. Let me take the following limit. So in the limit x goes to 0, I claim that this operator c of x, comma the, the derivative um, with all the indices mu1 to mu l goes to um, So this is one expression. So in the limit x going to 0, this operator c, this differential operator c that came from the three-point function, uh, goes to that form, OK? You can, you can prove that. 
for the leading contribution because uh, the 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 you know the leading contribution we're taking the limit x going to zero, so that power x to the k that we were considering had to be the power that leads to the largest contribution, and this allows you to determine this form for the c. Okay, that's very good. And now, uh, what we want to do is take this thing over here, this c, and stick it in here. So, in order to do this and be consistent, I have to send x1 to x2 and x3 to x4. Okay? So that that x goes to zero. Because x12 is x1 minus x2. Okay? So, uh, this limits then x12 goes to zero and x34 goes to zero. This is the limit in which I can use that equation I wrote down. And um, if I look in the u and the v, remember the u in the numerator has x12 and x34, right? And so u will be going to zero, and v turns out will be going to one, because you know v has x14 in the denominator and x34, and then x23 and x14. So identifying these points this way means that the numerator and the denominator become the same for v, while u goes to zero. Okay. So now I take that thing and I plug it into that expression that I wrote there for the g delta l in this limit. And it turns out you can work this out. It's not, you know, it, it takes a little work. That in this limit, this is Uh, a function of u and v. Well, it's not even obvious that it's a function of u and v here. Okay? Uh, but So it's very instructive to go and work it out. Um, here I should write that this is a function of x2, 4. Because we did the OP in 1, 2 and we were left with a two-point function at point two and at point four for the operators. I forgot to write that. Anyway, so here it's not even obvious that this is a function of u and v. And we didn't prove it, but at least in this limit, it works out. It's just a function of u and v. Okay? So now we want to compute this conformal block in you know a little bit more detail and understand it how, uh, understand how it looks even away from this u goes to zero, v goes to one limit. I didn't, I didn't do the algebra, obviously, but you know you can go ahead and do it, and you'll find this, this answer. So as I already said, in order to, I mean, these expressions were known, limits were known, but from the 70s already, right? But it took more than 30 years for people to look at this and understand how to actually determine the blocks. And as I said in the beginning, uh, you know, Dolan and Osborne went through this calculation. They set up a certain recursion relation. I'm not going to show you how that works. They recognized a certain recursion, recursion relation on how those, uh, uh, th th that these things have to satisfy. And then they realized that actually, actually there is a faster way to get them by um, looking at a Casimir of the conformal group. And the idea here is, well, you have a multiplet, you want to resum, it helps to have an operator that acts on all this multiplet with the same eigenvalue, which is the definition of a Casimir, right? So I need a differential operator that acts with the same eigenvalue on every particular state in that multiplet. That's the Casimir. So what's the Casimir for the conformal group? Well, let's see. In the previous lecture, I mentioned that if we start with Euclidean, d-dimensional Euclidean space, then we get, well, if we start with Minkowski space, we get SO d comma 2. But then I said that if you start with Euclidean, um, d-dimensional Euclidean space, then the conformal group becomes SO, SO um, d plus 1 comma 1. 
which is like the Minkowski group of d plus two dimensions, right? We said that. So we're now going to use that because if I know the conf I know that the conformal group in sorry the Minkowski group. I know the conformal Casimirs of the Minkowski group. I just have these generators m nu nu, and the Casimir at leading order, the quadratic one is just m nu nu squared, right? So I'm going to take the conformal group, view it from Euclidean space. So it's SO d plus 1, comma 1. So we have this group SO d plus 1, comma 1. And the way to realize this is to make a new m matrix. So I'm going to call it MAB, which is the following matrix. I'm going to take M nu nu and put it in the corner there. Here I'm going to put and this is the mu nu indices. Let me write it down and then we'll look at it. So this is the matrix, OK? I define this matrix where the indices A, B go from, you know, go over d, d plus 2 values. This is the Lorentz group in D dimensions. But here, it turns out that I can, uh, because I have SO d plus 1, comma 1, which is the Lorentz group of d plus 1 dimensions, I can make these M matrices now, which satisfy the same algebra as these M matrices. I'm not going to write it down. Right? But for indices that run over more values. Okay? And I can put the operators in like this. And they're going to be antisymmetric, of course. So these are antisymmetric. I can put them here. That's fine. Here I have to have zeros. And then I have to have some minus signs. Minus signs here, minus sign here, and here. So it's antisymmetric. It's basically the same, satisfies the same algebra. And with this trick, I can borrow what I know from the Lorentz group. In particular, that the Casimir is just this operator squared, this MAB squared, and construct using it explicitly the Casimir of the conformal group. Okay? That's just the trick. So I don't have to worry about, because of this isomorphism of the Euclidean conformal group to the, uh, Loren, to the Minkowski, Lorentz group for, for um, d plus 2 dimensions. I can use this, this trick. OK, so my quadratic Casimir is this. Let me see how I normalized it. Let's call it C. It's 1 half MAB, MAB. And this turns out to be 1 half m nu nu m nu nu okay where d is the the space time little d is the space time dimension okay so this is uh, the conformal casimir of the conformal sorry the quadratic casimir of the conformal group and what is this good for? Well, what we want to do is take this and use it, use it in the four-point function, right? So we know that if we have something like this, this Casimir, sorry, not the Casimir, but this operator, the MAB that we wrote there, acting on this, then we know that there is going to be you know, some minus sign that we discussed before, and then some differential operator acting at point 1, and then some differential operator acting at point 2. It's 
So there's going to be an equation like this, right? For the way, the way this operator acts on the operator product phi at x1, phi at x2. And therefore, we, using this, we know how the conformal Casimir acts on operator products. And now we're going to take that and stick it into the four-point function. And we're going to remember that this is a Casimir, which means that it acts the same way in all multi uh, states in the same multiplet, right? So this is the key observation, which gives us an equation Um, of this form over here. So use in four-point function the Casimir, and what you find is an expression of this type. I'm not going to derive it, but you can work it out yourselves. And then there is some where this is the eigenvalue of the Casimir, which is the same for the whole block. This is what I mean when I say that it acts in the same way. The eigenvalue can be defined for the whole block, as opposed to each individual operator that contributes, because it's a Casimir. And um, its value, if you want to determine what this over here is, you can determine it as delta O times delta O minus D, I'm not going to work this out. It's very instructive to go back and uh, work this stuff out yourselves. Also, in the notes, you know, people discuss them more in lecture notes, like the ones I shared with you on the in the first day or before the first day. Anyway, now this operator is a differential operator. It acts on this one and two, so you need to uh, you need to pass it through this x one two over here. So you can appropriately pass it through. And then you get an equation for the block itself. The equation says that D is oops. So remember, we use the Casimir inside the four-point function and we said, since it's a Casimir, all the contributions associated with the primary will use the same, will have the same eigenvalue. So we got this equation over here. And then we passed this D12 through and got an equation that says that there is an operator D, which I'm going to write down now, of which the conformal block is an eigenfunction with a known eigenvalue. OK? And this operator D takes uh, the form, let me just write it down, uh, it's not easy. Okay, certainly not a pretty operator. But this is what you get. Okay. And now you say, okay, great. Let me try to solve this differential equation. And then you realize that you can't solve it. Okay. Um, meaning that you go to the books and they don't have the solution. <laughs> but. <laughs> What the books have is a solution to another differential equation that you can get to if you do a certain change of variables, as always. It's not easy to guess the change of variables. But it is guessed 
you know, by sort of thinking of this four-point function again in some limits, I will show you after I tell you what it is, how, you know, uh, people looked at the four-point function and came up with this guess. But the guess is that if I take u and write it as zz bar and v as 1 minus z, 1 minus z bar, if I do this, I get another differential equation. Now the block is going to be a function of zz bar. That d operator becomes some zz bar uh, dependent operator as well with derivatives on zz bar. And that one uh, you can solve in some dimensions. Not always. In d equal 3, for example, you cannot solve it. In d equal 5, in no even dimension, can, odd dimension can you solve it. But say in d equal 2, and sorry? Because, well, this change of variables is not, yeah, it's not uh, working the same way. It's because it relies exactly on that, yeah. It doesn't work the same way in odd dimensions, yeah. So in 2D, so D equals 2 and D equals 4, it turns out that you can actually find in 2D, So let me write down what this is. The dimension appears in the eigenvalue, and it will also appear in um, uh, it will also appear when you do the change of variables here. In D, in the other coordinates, will have D dependence. There will be a D minus two. And what, what, if I wrote things correctly. Sorry, there is a D here. There's also a D here. Yes, there's a D here. The D dependence from here will also appear in the. Right. But the form of the differential equation simplifies for even d. And for odd d, uh, there are no known solutions in terms of elementary functions. I mean, in the sense that you can write it in terms of elementary functions. But it's the same. It's, it's the same differential equation. equation. Of course, of course. You can use it to approximate the blocks uh, at your heart's content, but you will not be able to write them as elementary functions. That's what I mean, yeah. So, which is what I'm doing now. So. In 4D, this is where This is the answer in 2 and 4D. So it's written in terms of elementary function, functions to the extent that you call these things elementary. <laughs> and, but that's what people call them, meaning that someone else wrote it down already. And uh, you can uh, check that the differential operator in the ZZ bar coordinates annihilates, well, it doesn't annihilate, but gives you that eigenvalue that we motivated has to appear because of the fact that we're using a Casimir. OK? Any questions? Yes? In 2D, should it, shouldn't it factorize? In 2D, it factorizes in the sense that there is a piece that it has a Z and a Z bar. There are two pieces. Yeah. And this has to be the case because you have to match a certain uh, boundary condition. I didn't mention this. You, you also want this to match the boundary. Of course, you're solving a differential equation. But you want this differential equation to match the boundary condition. Uh, in the limit u to 0, v to 1 that I discussed. And you have to take this combination of... Uh, of, of yeah, but uh, this, I mean, this sum, I mean, if you take a sum of two terms, then it, it doesn't factorize anymore. It doesn't. Yep. But, uh, I just, I mean, you mean factorize a function of z and then a function, yeah. a function of z bar? Yeah, it doesn't. 
This is the global conformal block, not some Virasoro block. So it contains infinite Virasoro operators. Yes. Infinite number of... Uh, and if you do the Virasoro block, somehow it factorizes? Um, this, no, this one, this is the global block, and yeah. does, it, it has this form. The Virasoro block, it, are you asking if the Virasoro block factorizes? Uh, yeah, sorry, right. So in the yellow book, Yes, the Virasoro block, yes. But okay. this contains an infinite number of but Virasoro yeah, so, blocks. But you can, you can group like several primaries? Or uh, well, global primaries or Virasoro primaries? It's so the opposite. The Virasoro block contains an infinite number of nodes. Right, 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 right. The opposite, yes. Yes, okay. yes. The Virasoro, yes, exactly. Yeah. So here we only use, you know, L0, L minus 1, and L1. We don't use the rest of the algebra, of the Virasoro algebra. So the Virasoro, um, you will have an infinite number of these operators for every Virasoro primary, global primaries. Okay, so what did I want to say? Yeah, I wanted to sort of motivate this change of variables. And um, let's finish with that. So this change of variables came about when people were thinking about simplifying limits for the four-point function, but not really limits in this case. Here they said, well, there are, way, there are things we can do to make the four-point function look simpler, and those things involve using conformal transformation. So you start, you start with this four-point function, x1, x2, x3, and x4. But then you say, I can do the following things. OK. I'm going to use a special conformal transformation to send x4 to infinity. OK? So now x4 has gone to infinity. That's very good. And then I'm also going to use um, a translation with a translation uh, send x1 to 0. So this is a thing usually done in situations where you want to simplify the form of the four-point function. This is not a limit. You're just using transformations and you're obtaining the four-point function in a certain, uh, with a certain, uh, in a certain rotated frame, if you want. OK? So you do that. Then you say, I still, I, OK, I'm I used my special conformal transformations. I used my translations. Let me now use some rotations as well. So with rotations, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this x3 and write it in this form. Um, sorry. With rotations, I'm going to write it in this form. I cannot eliminate the norm of x3, but I'm going to arrange it in this way. OK? And this is, over here, is a d minus 2 dimensional vector. Uh, we're in d dimensions. So I can do this with rotations. Now I still have dilatations. So, and with dilatations, I can choose them. I can choose them so that this x3 is equal to 1. OK. So I've used some rotations. I took a vector in d dimensional space, and I make it point along a certain axis because I have all these d dimensional rotations, right? Now that I've done this, I haven't exhausted my rotations because I can still rotate around that axis without changing that vector, right? To change where the only remaining point may lie, but I cannot put that on an axis. The only thing I can do with it is put it on a plane, right? I can rotate around this axis to put it on some plane I choose. And then I'm done. Then I have no other transformation. So, uh, so now we rotate. Uh, so that uh, x2 is in the plane a, b, 0. So um, this is our um, conformal transformations. We've done all this. Uh, we fixed the form of the four-point function to be in this frame. 
And now, the only parameters left, my four-point function now depends only on A and B. Everything else is fixed. And I can define two complex numbers, A plus IB and Z bar, which is A minus IB. And it turns out that if you did all this and you tracked what it did to U and V, these other things that we were discussing, uh, invariants that we were discussing, you would see that the U and V are mapped to Z, Z bar and 1 minus Z, 1 minus Z bar um, under this, uh, in this frame, okay? And this is a particularly simplified frame. And then you look at all these constraints that we were writing in this frame, and you recognize that you can solve the differential equation, um, and the rest is history. I, um, I don't know of a better way to motivate these other than you just try to look at the four-point function in a simplified way. That's the most you can do, and in that frame, you can get this relation, which you then use in the conformal Casimir equation to find a differential equation that happens to be uh, solvable in terms of elementary functions in two and four dimensions. Okay, so I went over time, but uh, it was worth it. And uh, next time we'll, we'll talk about uh, how we use all this uh, to, and crossing symmetry to actually get some non-perturbative bootstrap results. All right, thank you.